um, as it relates to Joyce's care lessons and also as it relates to the new uh, state mandate on uh, uh, guidance program at the elementary school and, and having guidance, uh, having students have access to a licensed guidance counselor. So again, you'll hear more about that, but I think it's an exciting uh, initiative that we're, that we're focused on and extremely important as we try to balance the rigors of the workload of our students and also have them be well-rounded and have the skills that they need uh, in order to navigate uh, the, the challenges that they're gonna face when they leave us. So at this point, I'm gonna ask Tricia and uh, maybe just Tricia first to come up and uh, begin the presentation. Okay, so good evening. Um, Joyce and I are very excited that we get a chance to talk about the work that we've been doing around the social emotional learning program uh, that we started in our elementary school this year. Um, this program was developed in collaboration with our school psychologists and the consultant that they've been working with, Dr. Kelly Grayling, um, from Cognitive Behavioral uh, <coughs> Consultants. So um, as Dr. Monasano mentioned, we've been doing a lot of thinking K-12 about um, how social emotional learning and wellness fits in the Brunswick Promise. And you know, we've really come to this conclusion that it's at the heart of what we do and that we can't achieve these goals of the promise without paying special attention to the growth and development of our students um, socially and emotionally. Um, and as, as he also mentioned, we got together last week to talk about wellness in, in, um, in terms of the Bronx Hill Promise. Um, we talked about our program um, and how we're working to meet uh, the needs of our kids with um, distress tolerance, emotional regulation, advocating for themselves, and creating positive relationships. Uh, so today, Joyce and I will talk to you about what our program looks like, so you kind of get a rough view. Um, and we, and we'll talk about what our students are learning and what we're learning about them. We have some good pre and post data that we'd like to share with you. Uh, we'll talk about how our SEL program fits in with the challenge success data that we have from grades six through 12. And then we'll also talk about how our SEL program fits into our larger guidance framework for the elementary school. Um, so the, the program that we put in place um, is based on something called dialectical behavioral therapy, or what we refer to as DBT. Um, and it's, it's uh, based on the work from the consultant we use, uh, Dr. Grayling. Um, and we've taken something that our psychologists have been using pretty intensively with kids who need that level of work, and we've made it um, appropriate for a whole class. Um, and it's divided into four different modules, as you'll see there. So we focus on mindfulness, um, distress tolerance for kids to be able to handle something when it goes wrong, um, to regulate their emotions, and also um, interpersonal relationships. Right there is that chart that you're looking at that's hanging in the classroom where they have, we gave them skills to handle when they're distressed. Um, here's an example of, of a lesson from one of those modules. Um, this is something we talk about all the time in elementary school now. It's sort of part of our language and vocabulary that we use with kids. It's called wise mind. Um, you'll see in that little Venn diagram there, you've got emotion mind on one side, which is when your thoughts and behaviors are controlled only by your feelings. And then that's when your emotion mind versus fact mind, which is only the facts and you're not thinking about your emotions. And we work with kids to get them into what we call wise mind, where we want them to make decisions based both on their feelings and the facts. <laughs> okay, I just need a minute to get my notes organized here. I got some visuals. So I just want to start out by thanking Dr. Montesano and Dr. Kelly for giving me the shortest retirement on record. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, thanking the Board of Education for approving mm -hmm. my coming back to um, teach the care program. You know, I've said it many times and at many presentations, but it's really a privilege, privilege and an honor to work in this district. I am grateful to come in here every day and Roy will tell you, sometimes I just literally burst into his office to share what some anecdote or something that's come up uh, with the kids. Um, it's, it's the most glorious work to work with children, helping them to 
seek the truth and to work with teachers who are dedicated and energized every day to help them find it. So, you know, I spent many years in the middle school and I've had uh, experience in the high school and prior to this Ordsley High School. And as a district, as a community, we are definitely witnessing the same trends that we're seeing documented across the nation, particularly affluent districts. Students are more stressed, students, there are higher levels of depression, and there's certainly higher levels of worrisome behavior. It's to the district's credit and to your credit that you're recognizing that we have to provide um, students with the resources, the social emotional resources to be able to cope both socially and educationally. And I, and, and I, I want to strongly acknowledge it. Everything that we do, everything that we do for kids rests on their ability to be self-aware and to self-regulate, and that's, that's the basis of our program. It's important that kids understand that they do have it in their power to develop skills and choices, and not only to cope, but to thrive. And um, <laughs> one of the points that we make when we talk about emotion mind and wise mind and fact mind is that you need to take what you know, you need to recognize how you feel, and then you need to make a considered choice. So for example, I had a fifth grader today, uh, we were talking about how to use actually distract skills, which is an acronym for different skills that you can use when you're overwhelmed with your emotions. And uh, this kid said to me, well, said to the entire class, oh, well, I just had a meltdown. So I said, well, wait, so you're telling me that you're a snowman and somebody put a heat lamp over you and you know you just crumpled? You know, and that's what we're working on in every class with kids, making appropriate choices based on what they know and based on how they feel. It sounds pretty good, right, high school kids? <laughs> okay. um, but I want to I, I, I want to point out that even though I you know I wore my mala beads and my little booties, we're not trying to create a kumbaya world or a, a Deepak Chopra retreat, but rather. We're recognizing with kids that yes, life is stressful, and stress is inevitable, and actually it's important to have stress in manageable, no, manageable doses. It's a part of life. Our curriculum here is challenging, and we recognize that you know, with kids. And our goal is that we want our kids to do well in a competitive world. We want them to be able to compete. We want them to be able to have self-efficacy. We want them to have the emotional wherewithal to be successful both you know, uh, personally and professionally. And to do that, we need to teach them SEL skills. We need to teach them emotional um, intelligence, social intelligence, and we're better to do that than in their natural habitat in the classroom. So what does it look like? It's a push-in model. It's basically 20 minutes, although I've been known to go over time. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what we do is it's lesson-based. For, so for today, on the, for the third grade, we talked about make, making healthy body choices. We talk about sleep, eating, et cetera. In kindergarten today, we talk to them about how to use their wise mind when it's so hard to wait. Did I, no, I did the, okay. And in fifth grade, we talked about the skills that they uh, can use when they have strong emotions. After that, they turn and talk. I love this model. We give them a problem to solve, they face each other, they have a conversation. Um, then we regroup, we share, and we come up with strategies and um, how we're going to integrate the concepts of the day to our life. So yesterday in fifth grade, kids, you know, I don't have to tell you guys, kids have a lot of anxiety about math tests, right? And it was one of their, maybe one of even their first math tests, I'm not quite sure. So they brought that up and we talked, not only did we talk about the strategies, what of how do you cope with 
um, anxiety when it starts to be, uh, be overwhelming, but we talked about coping ahead and planning ahead. So what do you do with that? How do you, how do you plan for yourself so you're not fighting with your parents at nine o'clock at night over their attempts to help you when you procrastinated? How are we educating <laughs> teachers? Teachers, first of all, the ever, in, I, I should have pointed this out. So when we do the lessons, the teachers are they, they're not at Starbucks, right? They are there in the classroom participating in the lessons. As are the aides. We really work to make, uh, if there's a classroom aide, to have that aide as part of the, the community, part of the lesson. Secondly, I go regularly to grade level team meetings to, and we talk about what's working, what should we improve on, what are the themes coming up. I also have been meeting with the special area teachers so they can be sure to, for example, who better to teach uh, uh, and reflect on the difference between an urge and an action than a technology teacher. We need to teach urges and actions with the use of technology from day one. And it's happened. So they are integrating uh, the lessons and uh, the concepts into the classrooms. And we talk about it all the time. Where else can we do this? How can we do it? Uh, we do it in P, uh, PE, all the special areas. All the teachers in the elementary school and many of the teachers in the middle school and the high school have had training in um, DBT theory and workshops, how to validate kids, how to handle anxieties. That's been happening for at least two years now. We, uh, the psychologist um, and I have um, done book studies with teachers. And um, hold on, let me just get, I want to get the, the numbers right. Uh, Dr. Thomas is offering graduate uh, credit on DBT this, this semester for 20 teachers in the district and next semester I believe it's 13 or 14 teachers in the district and she's going to include a second se session after this. So there, there's really a lovely integration and collaboration on all levels. And our goal is that, you know, when Joyce is, is not there, that the teachers understand, have a full understanding of the concepts that they can um, use them with the students as well. I just wanted to show you a couple of things that we're doing because it, you know, I meet. With, the challenge is to uh, deliver this on a de developmentally appropriate level, right? So, what we've done, we've done this with every class, but I, I just get, I, I want to just concretize this. So this, these, this is here's your wise mind, and at the beginning of the school year, we talked about the challenges of the new grade and their anxieties about what they're going to learn, and the tendency, and what happens when we feel um, stressed about our learning? What can we say to ourselves? How can we use our wise mind to keep going? So this student wrote, walk away when I get frustrated, I can say I can do this. And we posted these throughout the classroom. This student, I can do this, and I love this. We talk about the power of yet. I haven't learned this yet, right? Don't give up, keep on going, go forward, don't stop. Uh, you fail, you try again. Now, this one is a particularly endearing because not only did she write and put a rainbow in a wise mind, she even has it coming through her two, two ears. First attempt at learning, keep going forward. You never fail until you stop trying. The kids came up with this as a group. They talked to each other to develop self-talk or, um, you know, uh, and, and, and what we do know is uh, mindset is particularly important in success in mathematics. And we focus on that quite frequently. And then we started the year with an attitude of gratitude. Kids drew what they felt grateful for in life. There's lots of research to suggest that if we start our day thinking about at least three things that we're grateful for, we automatically change our brain chemistry, and I talked to them about that. So this student is family, my dog, home, food, water. This multi-football, uh, family, dog, friends, school, life, teachers. The one that I couldn't find that I showed to Roy on day one was the first grader who wrote pasta bolognese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, okay, back on to parents. You cannot teach these skills if there's not a collaboration with home. So, and we recognize that. And parents want to know what we're teaching and they want to integrate it. So what are we doing? I, I meet regularly with the council chairs. Uh, we did a formal presentation to, the, uh, to one of the first um, uh, PTA council meetings. And I do what I call, and I learned this from Challenge Success, we do flybys, 10 minutes show up at a meeting, this is what we're doing, you might want to try it. I, at least once a month, I send the parents, uh, Trisha sends it for me, a newsletter about what we're doing in class, what are the terms that we're using, what is the language they need to use at home. Uh, we're also, um, uh, the psychologist has presented at bold meetings. And we're going to have regular book studies. So the first book study we're doing is uh, first week in February. I'm doing one in the evening and then during the day about, uh, and this book is called Unselfie. It's fabulous. It's really about teaching kids empathy. I do want to, I have to put this in too, because this was a beautiful moment about empathy. What the third grades did this year, because we talk a lot, we t talk a lot in the um, um, wellness meetings too about expressing gratitude, but also doing things with people as opposed to for people. So what the third grades thought of is let's show gratitude to the police department. So they used a math lesson on measurement to bake cookies, and they invited the police department, and it was pretty impressive, right? Boy, the, the number of police who showed up, I guess it was a low crime day in Bronxville, <laughs> right? So uh, Captain Satrielli showed up, he brought a, you know, a, a female police officer and a sergeant, and the kids were ecstatic. And it was a real lesson about how to be a good citizen. Uh, they were really impressed about arrests. They asked, it was, it, 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 it was an important moment where we express appreciation for people who do so much to keep us safe. And we continue to think about that. What are we learning? We want hard data and we want anecdotals. We want this to be evidence-based. It'd be nice to say, yeah, things are going well. And by the way, they are. But we, we gave the students from grades three to five surveys at the beginning of the year. And what we wanted to measure was how strong, um, we wanted to measure coping emotions. So what did we find out? We found out that kids can label their emotions. They're pretty good at, by this point in time of identifying. Teachers feel maybe not so much as the students feel they can, but that's usually par for the course. What, did, what else did we find out? We found out that our students do not express distress generally in behavior. We know that. Our kids are so well behaved. It's a safe building and kids feel safe with each other. But what they do do and what they did put in the data is that they are internalizers. So what happens? They get upset, they can't focus. They get upset, they have trouble moving on. Um, what we're going to do, and, and, and as one kid told me the other day, when I get nervous, I feel like a car that's stuck in the snow. My wheels keep on turning, and I don't know how to get the car out. What we're going to do is at the end of the year, we're going to give the same survey and see if there's any improvement. What are we learning anecdotally? Your kids love to share. I, I would be in the class all day. In fact, Trisha said, stop asking them and have them talk in turn. You know, I, as a psychologist, I walk in and I'm like, oh, tell me more. You're like, this is heaven for me, right? But we have to get on with the lesson. This is not therapy, right? They love to share, they love to talk, and they are critical thinkers. They are, I'm astonished. On a, on a daily basis of the connections that kids make and how active and generous they are in sharing. Um, they love, they love mindfulness. They get on the rug, they assume the position, right? Some are better than others at it. You know, we talk to the kids who have more difficulty focusing and why that is and how they can self-regulate to get more, in a more mindful state. And we know, by the way, 
that mindfulness is evidence-based. You've all heard about the monks. Yes, their frontal lobes are well-developed, but the neurobiologists are also looking at kids in school and documenting that it increases focus, blood flow to the brain, increases social behavior, and decreases uh, behavioral problems. What else are we learning? We're learning that uh, kids can, uh, can use face-to-face -face turn and talk for active problem solving. We're also learning that kids are able, um, if you give them the chance, they can display incredible self-reflection. And th they do know that it's important to think about themselves. Oh, a couple other things. They're making connections to literature. Kids are also tired. Kids are really tired. They have a lot on their plate. When I do mindfulness at the end of the day, I cannot turn off the lights. Um, that's just a, a, a point I want to make. And the other thing that teachers are reporting to me is that kids who have difficulty risking or participating academically are risking more emotionally. And we're confident as they learn to take risks in the care classes that that will translate into taking more academic risks because they feel safe and not judged. How does this fit in with challenge success? We're seeing the same levels, not, not I, I wouldn't say the same levels, but the stress and anxiety that we see in high school and middle school students are also evident in elementary school students. Certainly not to the degree, but all of them know what stress is. Even the kindergartners, you know, will talk about stress. And they can report and identify how they're impacted by it. Yes, our students are internalizers. On a wonderful note, they really want to please their parents. So when they bring up problems to solve, how to use their wise mind, they often talk about situations at home. Right down uh, to kindergarten, where a little girl said to me the other day, Mommy was very upset with me, and she made me take a time out. And I kept crying louder and louder and louder. And then I realized that wasn't going to work. So then I went in and apologized. That is like, that's really using your wise mind. Um, and that students in grades three to five, they report really feeling that there's a lot on their plate. And I'm not talking about homework. I'm really talking about the number of activities and things they're involved in. I think yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so how does the program that Joyce just described fit in with an elementary guidance program? We've been doing a lot of thinking about this lately given the new regulations that are out there where elementary students have to have access to a, a guidance counselor. And when you think about a guidance program, it's really the three categories that you see up there. So there's the personal social, career, post-secondary, and academic. And you know, high quality guidance program is gonna help students answer the questions of like, who am I, where am I going, and how will I get there? Um, and when we think about that framework and the work we're doing with our SEL program, you know, where, what, where, what are we hitting um, really well, and then kind of where are our gaps? Um, we think that the, the care program is really getting at the personal social piece. Um, and, and even at the academic, as we teach kids how to be mindful and focus and get ready to learn. Um, so we're, we're doing some, some thinking around uh, where are the gaps in terms of this new mandate and how can we use it to best meet the needs of our kids. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. questions? Um, how much time or do you think it makes sense to spend on having the kids learn to communicate with each other verbally versus texting and emailing? I mean, uh, uh, for the people I interact with who are younger professionals, uh -huh. if you ask them to do something, oftentimes, oh, I didn't know, or I, you know, I, I texted so and so, and it's like, well, did you try picking up? Like, and there's no response. Yeah. There's no like, right. pick up the phone, then we'll yeah. walk over the 15 feet to the person's desk. <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's obviously not the same as, as a school environment, but I would think that right. we, things can be, you know, managed better verbally than they are on text or email and maybe teaching that as a skill is something we have to do. Right. I mean, our students talk to each other throughout the day in every lesson. Yeah. I mean, Joyce mentioned this turn and talk and this 
just find this instructional strategy that kind of blew our mind, which is like so natural in what we do in every, you know, ELA and math and science, so everywhere we use that strategy because it's so important for kids to learn to talk to each other socially and academically. So we have it throughout. Um, do we have a, mid a middle school strategy for that? <laughs> I, mean, I, think, I suspect by seventh, sixth grade they have phones, right? Or seventh grade they get phones. I think it's it's embedded in every single interaction that every teacher has with students. Uh, there's even though we we do rely on Chromebooks uh, for uh, present pre pre presenting work, the work is done socially, and the work is is shared with their teachers socially. Very. Um, very little of it is done online, if you will. And um, I, I think that it's central to what middle school does. I'm kind of surprised that you, start, you hear words, I'm thinking about elementary schools. I, I don't have a child in it, the youngest, I have a sophomore, but I hear words overwhelmed, stressed, and tired. Yeah. I don't associate that with kids that are in you know, kindergarten through fifth grade. Maybe I'm, yeah. is that concerning? Yeah. I mean, it's got to be. Yeah, it is concerning. I think that's kind of the, was, yeah. you know, the point for us, yeah. you know, to, to kind of <coughs> hear from them, hear their stories. What's nice is that through the lessons that Joyce is doing, these students have the opportunity to talk about that, and they really want to, you know, and it's important to make space for that in the day because we get so focused on our lessons and getting through everything, but, like, we really have to recognize that kids need that outlet to talk about what they're going through and their feelings and, and what to do. So you, so you are stressed. Let's recognize that and, and what strategies do you have to manage it um, yeah I think it's real it's a, it might as surprising as it is do teachers give that feedback at the teacher parent yeah. conferences if they notice stress or anxiety in students oh yeah definitely you know Mike had the same reaction for sure yeah you know I mean, Trisha came in with this stuff I'm like you know our kindergarten first grade was feeling like anxious and yeah. showing signs of anxiety mm -hmm. how's toward actually yeah, you know, we're talking to some of this, and you know, we were. I was at last night the presentation they gave for the tenth grade parents, and there were a couple of students. So eleventh grade, okay, I understand eleventh grade. Your SAT, you're thinking about college, and yeah, I can understand it there. But I mean, kids have good kids. It doesn't sound like mm. our they're, kids are kids anymore. Anyway. They're scheduled wall to wall. Yeah. So Mike, I had an opportunity to hear from somebody who had moved into our community from the Midwest, outside of Chicago, as an example. And they were floored, and they have um, grade school, elementary school, school kids were floored how scheduled everybody was after after school. But that's what it is. It's so unbelievable to watch it coming from outside and coming in. And that's one of the reasons we want this that this wellness committee does want to do some of that work and try to share it with our community to try to get some you know, partnership going with our with so parents. Should have parents in here? I'm hoping. Yeah. Well, there are some parents on that yeah. on that committee, but that evening as well. We think it's an important conversation that we have to start having. Can I say something? I, I, and that's how challenge success. I was uh, lucky enough or fortunate enough, enough to participate as a middle school psychologist in challenge success. We actually went to Palo Alto and has had a lot of follow up. With that's how Denise Povin challenge success is helpful to the district because we also, yes, you know, the times are more stressful, we all know that, but we also look at ourselves as a district and how can we look at our institution and make it more user-friendly to students, make it less stressful. Um, and we did put in, in the middle school and the high school a number of things in place. And I've always said to Denise, I want to. I like to be that downward extension into the elementary school because they, they um, focus on middle school and high school. But that's exactly what, what we use challenge success for and, and really valuable, valuable suggestions. And it's, a little tr it's a little troubling to find that we are actually in a much stronger position and we've done a lot more than many of our peer schools at challenge success. So there's a lot of uh, positive feedback that we've gotten from uh, member schools as well. One of the things they identified, though, is there's a lot of make work. Have we meaningfully cut back on the make work here at, in this institution? I'm not talking about throughout yeah. K through 12. Yes. So we um, have. Yes, we reduce our. Are you talking about home, homework? Or is there any? Yes. yes. Homework, yes, projects, reduced. tests, quizzes. Yes. We we've cut back on all we, that. We all across the board. Yes. In the elementary school, yes. I can speak to that. 
middle school and high school? Yes. Okay. More to do, but we're working on it actively. Thanks, Trish. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. everybody. Um, I am very excited to put um, this resolution before the board this evening um, as a result of uh, Barbara Dine's retirement, one of our high school counselors. I have the pleasure of introducing you to Andrea Pelican, who is joining us this evening. Thank you for being here. Um, Ann Meyer led a comprehensive search uh, for a new high school counselor and uh, we were just so pleased, given that it was mid-year, that we were able to find someone so highly qualified. Uh, so Andrea, um, with your approval this evening, um, is planning on uh, joining us January 22nd. Um, so in addition to that first resolution, um, as a result of that, we have a revised teacher mentor um, list for you. Um, that includes um, Andrea's mentor, as well as two elementary leave replacements that you have before you tonight, as well as their mentors. Um, we have um, some unexpected resignations of teacher aides, um, not unusual, but uh, ones that we are looking to, um, to replace, as well as rounding out as a result of resignations to in our maintenance um, unit, a custodial uh, maintenance worker, as well as a building's maintenance worker. So you have before you to consider items A through J, please. Thank you. Um, can I get a motion to consider items A through J? Move. Second. Okay. Any questions or comments or discussion on any of those items? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any nays? Welcome Great. aboard. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we also need to, uh, the mentoring team as part of that? Okay, so. Um, Nobody can see this, but the board has <laughs> had a preliminary financial report. Uh, I believe it's for the month of November. Mm -hmm which uh, states that we're tracking pretty good, you know, uh, and it bodes well for the, the budget work that we're, we're going to be doing over the next month or two. Um, we're projecting a surplus in the current year of about half a million dollars, which is uh, usually uh, over the past few years where we've started as an allocation of fund balance uh, in, our, in the budget process. Um, I would expect this between now and the end of the year to go up a little bit, Although the tuition uh, revenue line will be going down as we had a couple of students move out for the second semester, but uh, we're still, you know, tracking well compared to uh, where original budget was. Um, but uh, I think we're in good shape this this uh, this year financially. There is one financial action item that just came off the board from our bond council. It's related to the referendum uh, that was passed in December, uh, and it's a resolution from the board uh, for the issuance of $3 million in bonds. We want to close this as soon as possible while rates are very favorable, and it will be the last piece of our financial plan to finance all this work that's uh, obviously in the room we're in still ongoing as well. Um, the reason this is ongoing is because this is part of that project. Uh, it wasn't part of the library, um, the library renovation project. Once we get duct work into this room and, and some of the other rooms, then we'll put a ceiling in here, uh, get rid of these temporary covers of some piping, uh, and uh, we'll be good to go. Um, so. Uh, you know, we asked the, asked the board to pass this resolution and uh, it starts the clock. I think for probably within the next 30 to 60 days, we'll be able to close. Great. Um, can I get a motion to approve the bond resolution as discussed? So we second. second. Any discussion or questions for Dan? Is there any restrictions, Dan, on when we can 
issue the three billion, three million dollars? No, because it's tied to a certain project or something. Within five years of the referendum, to no. typically. Okay. Or it might even be, uh, might even be five years with the end of construction. I'm not sure, but uh, but you know, I, I think jumping on it is is the way to go. Locking in the low rates and amortizing it quickly as quickly as we can. And um, any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Waiting for negative rates. Moving on to facilities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Our pile test has passed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so work will begin uh, in the uh, courtyard area. Um, work continues at Meadow That's Avenue. Nice. Uh, they're demolishing that stairwell down there. Uh, the roof addition uh, over the blue gym is continuing. Uh, I think the steel work is done there, and they're, they're, uh, they continue to uh, box that in. Um, we are on the street for bids for the Innovation Center as one bid, and the curtain wall and everything else as another bid. Uh, those will be opened, uh, I think, February 3rd. Yeah, early February. So we're looking forward to that, and there's no facilities action. Are you getting, is it too early to know if there's a lot of interest in those bids, or what, what's going on? Uh, you know, I, we, we had a good experience with the contractor who did the library, so I, I sent the, the bids to them. I think they might be uh, interested in the Innovation Center. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's an attractive job because it's a winter job for, for these guys, you know. Uh, it's hard to get them in the summer, but if somebody really knows what they're doing, they can finish this thing by the summer. Yeah, because we can all allow them to work. Actually, just summer. During the yeah, summer because they can work during the school day. It's segregated. It's, it's on the end of the building. So there might be, we're hoping there's a lot of interest. But uh, is that, um, and is that the, the Innovation Center expected to be in use for the curriculum? It, it better be, because we have about three or four new courses ready that's to go for right. September 1. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's for your robotics class. We should propose. So Ann and I will be finishing that room ourselves during the summer. <laughs> yeah. Conversely, the, uh, the curtain wall is going to be a panic summer job. Yes. <laughs> We're ripping off the side of the building and hoping to get it up for the start of school. That's going to be... That's going to be a feat. <laughs> Although I will say the architects, when, when we were questioning about that, um, they felt more positive because we're going to the facade uh, curtain wall as opposed to the, to the replacing kind one, which was the less expensive option. It wouldn't look as nice because the lead time of getting that is a lot more. So they felt pretty pretty confident they'll be able to get it done over the summer. I know this really isn't your problem, but a lot, so many parents use that playground during the summer. Mm -hmm. So it, we probably, once we know it's not going to be available, we should mm -hmm. get that out to the sure. community. Oh, yeah. We live here. You know, mm -hmm. we're yes. hoping we can keep at least some of it open. Oh, do you, know? you think you can yeah, keep yeah. some of the playground open? At, at certain yeah. times. What? You know, just put up a big fence and uh, okay. kind of put Parents and small children will thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Dan's more confident. Than <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Not you might want to let Carl know. We'll see. We'll let him know. We're already shaking. <laughs> <laughs> any, any theory of no action? No action. Yeah. Um, policy review. I think this is the second reading, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of, the, of the voter registration policy we talked about last time. Um, did anybody have any questions or comments or discussion points on that? Great. Can we get a motion to approve? Item uh, policy 5605. I'm I'm like to ask for that Second. <laughs> All right, great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, committee reports. Uh, are there any material reports that folks have? We did the audit last time. No, but I, I should have up. said this a couple of minutes ago. I, um, I really do like the job that Land is doing. Um, and I think the combination of them and the construction managers um, is really good. good. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of finger crossing, but um, the plan that they had on the piles and the way they handled that, even when things weren't going our way, uh, they were good. It was nice to be able to work with them. Great. Again, a lot of you got to be a lot of finger crossing for the elementary curtain wall. 
Um, Everything's got to go right in a sunny summer. Yeah. Uh, on the action calendar, Connie, do we need to vote on the change of the date? Uh, no, we don't have to do that. Okay, so, so I we think we, this, we should pick a day. Public consumption, we can move the day of the board meeting. I'll just send out a public notice. Yeah. Same, same start time. Um, okay, with that, I think we move to the public public section of the meeting. So if anybody wants to, you know, yeah. from the audience wants to say anything, contribute. Okay, I think that's it. So we have a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All there.